All right, these are the notes for the last lesson in Chapter 3, which essentially connects the last few lessons, which, l which led to us being able to factor more complex polynomials, back to the first lesson, which was about visualizing the basics of graphs. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the difference when you have a factor that repeats. So for example, if you look at these three functions, they all have the same factor of x minus 5. So not surprisingly, they all have an x-intercept at positive 5. All, I'll have a root at 5 or a 0 at 5, all the same thing. But notice the shape, the way that these different functions approach, uh, or the way we say they behave around the x-intercept is quite different for each. Um, for the first one here, where the factor only exists one time, or that only repeats once, there's only one of it, it, you know, it, it's a line in this case, and it just goes straight through uh, the x-intercept. We call this a multiplicity of one, this type of behavior um, when a function, or a s specifically a polynomial function, just passes through the x-intercept almost like a line. Now, in this case, it is a line, but the idea is if it behaves like a line when it goes through the x-intercept, we call that a multiplicity of one. And notice it's not a coincidence. That's because this factor is to the power of 1. Um, when a factor repeats twice, perhaps you can guess we call that a multiplicity of 2. And that's when you have a factor repeating twice to a power of 2. And in that case, um, it does have an x-intercept in this same point at 5, but it looks quite different. It looks like a quadratic function with a vertex right there. It comes down, barely touches the x-axis at 5, then goes back up. Same thing, we'd also same thing if it was going the other way like this, we'd still call that a multiplicity of 2. Um, and a multiplicity of 3 is what this one is. Ooh. Sneaky F trying to get away from me. And that's when, you know, anytime you have the fact repeating three times, its x-intercepts, or its x-intercept around that area will look something like this, in which it behaves kind of like a power of, uh, like a cubic function, like x to the power of 3 kind of looks like this, where it comes from either the top or the bottom, touches at 5, but then it looks like it's going to come back down, but instead it goes back up the other way. Okay, so with that said, let's use some of this. And what I want to do next is use this, as well as things we've learned in previous lessons, to make a quick uh, but pretty accurate sketch of how this function behaves. Um, so as it says here, the things I care about are all the intercepts, x and y, the general shape of the function, um, and its end behavior. I then have one last comment. Also state the intervals where the function is positive. I'll talk about that in a bit, but first let me get to the, first, the main part, which is sketching um, on Sorry, I'm getting distracted by my phone. <laughs> uh, sketching the general behavior of this function. So the first thing I would do is look at my factors. And I can see, just because it's conveniently enough factored, I can see there's going to be an x-intercept at negative 5, positive 1, and positive 6. So let me draw that there. So negative 5, positive 1, and positive 6. I'll put it right here. OK, good place to start. Uh, next, let me pay attention to the multiplicity. So at positive, sorry, when x is negative 5 right here, this has a multiplicity of 2, which means I know it's either going to look like this or it's going to look like this around that intercept. All right? So let me just erase those for now, but it has to be one of those two. x equals 1 is the multiplicity of 3, which means I know it's either going to look like this or it's going to look like that. Okay, one of those two options. And lastly, x minus 6 has a multiplicity of 1, so I know it's either going to go through it like this or go through it like that. So how do I know which one it's going to be? Well, the last thing I want to pay attention to is the end behavior, which I can figure it from the degree. So what's the degree of this? Well, this function here has a degree of 6. And how do I know that? Well, one way is, the, I, think the, I think the easiest, is to imagine if I were, was to FOIL this out, at some point I'd go x times x, and then at some point I'd go x times x times x times another x. I just said x three times. Sorry, six times. And this would be, you know, at some point, if you were to FOIL this all out, your very first term would be x to the power of 6, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, 
And so if it's a six degree polynomial, a positive six degree polynomial, I know the end behavior must go like this. So I know the end behavior must go into quadrant two and quadrant one. If it was a negative leading coefficient, the end behavior would be down here. So what I'm talking about right now goes right back to our very first lesson. And so I know the end behavior is like this. I know my multiplicity. Um, let me start sketching the general shape. And so I know now it has to come down like this. It's, I already said the x-intercept at negative five had a, has a multiplicity of two, so it has to kind of look like a parabola, but then go back up. And then, you know, it has to at some point come back down. But as it approaches one, it's gonna again kind of flatten out, but it's instead of going back up, it's gonna go back down. And then at my x-intercept of six, that has a multiplicity of one, so it's gonna go straight through it. And there we go. So I'll erase those now. And there's my quick sketch. One last thing, as I never talked about the y-intercept, which, unless I made a mistake, I know is some positive number up here. Remember, I can find the y-intercept by just going into my equation. If it's my equation's in standard form, it's my constant term, but I don't see my constant term. So in this case, the fastest way of finding my uh, y-intercept is just to replace x with zero. And if I replace x with zero, uh, in the end I get 150. Or if you're the foil this whole thing out, you'd get 150 as your last term. But really, it's just replacing x with zero, and so I now know my y-intercept is 150. Notice if I got a negative number for my y-intercept, then I knew I made a, I would know with certainty I made a mistake somewhere, because my graph is going through a positive um, side of the y-axis. So quite often, again, like I keep saying, we can find our mistakes um, and notice our mistakes without anyone having to tell us. We tend to, if we make a mistake, we tend to contradict our work at some point. Lastly, let me get to this part that I've highlighted in pink. Also state the interval or intervals where the function is positive. When we say where the function is positive, that means where your, you know, your outputs of the function are positive, where your outputs are greater than zero, which means where your y values are greater than zero. And so highlighting it, this region here is positive, and this region here is positive, and this region here is positive. All those regions I've highlighted in yellow are positive. And so I can say here that f of x is greater than zero, well not greater than equal to, greater than zero. When, how do I describe those intervals? Well, when x is less than negative five, when x is between negative five and one, and when x is greater than six. That's why I can describe those intervals in terms of x. If I describe the intervals in terms of y, it's kind of silly. X, you know, the function is positive when y is positive. Well, thanks, right? So describing the intervals in terms of y is, is kind of meaningless here. So I need to describe in terms of x. Notice when x is actually negative five, the output is zero. Zero is not a positive number. Zero is not a negative number. So hence right here, if you look at my two intervals, negative five is not included in either of them. All right. So the most important thing though is visualizing these sketches of these graphs. And for the next one again, conveniently enough, it is factored. This time I wanna pay attention to the degree right away. The degree of this is gonna be five, but it has a I can see there's gonna be a negative leading coefficient. So it's an odd degree function with a negative leading coefficient. So I know it's gonna have end behavior here and here. Make that a little bit neater. Quadrants one, actually sorry, got that mixed up quadrants two and four. If it was a positive leading coefficient, it would be in quadrants uh, three and one. All right, so I have my end behavior right away. Next, I'm gonna do my x-intercepts. Negative two, positive four. All right, now next, the multiplicity. So this is a multiplicity of three. So I know it either looks like this or the other way around. Well, I know it has to be the first one because I can already see my end behavior. So I'll just leave that there for a moment in red. I know it has to look something like that. It's kind of a crappy drawing, but uh, for a quick little note to myself, it's good. And what x intercept of four, I know the multiplicity must be, uh, so I know from the multiplicity is two, so it looks like this or like this. Well, I know it has to be the second one because that's the only one that matches up with my end behavior. So I can pretty much see the details of my graph now. So let me just kind of make this a bit tidier. Um, look at my y-intercept. 
then we're good. And so I know it comes up. Again, looks like it's about to make a vertex for a quadratic function, but instead it goes back down. And then it must come back up. And then this is a multiplicity of two, so then it goes back down, and that's it. Now my y-intercept, I can see is some negative number. And if I go back to my equation and replace x with zero, I get one, negative 128. Calculators are quite useful for all this. There we go. There's my quick sketch of g of x. OK, um, so this time, again, I want to express where my function is positive. So g of x is positive right here, and that's it. So that's the only place where g of x is positive. So I can say g of x is positive when x is less than negative 2, and that's it. Only that. All right. So the last main one is not factored. And so really, honestly, most of our work in this is going to be factoring this. Now, if we make a mistake with our factoring, we are going to have the wrong graph. Um, so really, most of our work is based on the last few days. And so remember to factor this. Um, the first thing I want to do is make a guess. And I make a guess by looking at the factors of 16. There's a lot of factors of 16. Uh, that's it. To make my guess, I will pick a factor, x plus or minus some number. Then I'll take the opposite of that number right there and put it into x. And if I get a 0 out, that means the remainder is 0, which means it's a factor. Um, and I like to start with either 1 or negative 1. In fact, I usually like to start with a factor of x minus 1 as a guess because if that's right, it's pretty easy for me to check. I just replace positive 1 into all the x's. And if you replace po all those x's uh, with positive 1, you do get out 0. And so I now, with a quick check on the calculator, which I'm not going to bother showing you, um, I now know this will work. So my guess will work. Perfect. So I know that that's a factor. So now I use synthetic division, most likely. Long division is OK, but it's needlessly time consuming for this. And remember, if I'm dividing by x minus 1, I put a positive 1 right here. And now I'll complete my, long di my synthetic division. Notice I get a 0 for my remainder. And what do I have right here? Remember what that means. That means negative x squared plus 8x minus 16. I now want to factor that. It's a quadratic function. So the first thing I would do to factor that is I would factor out the negative. Uh, I would way rather deal with this if there was no negative in front of the x squared. And it's really easy to factor that out, just factor out the negative. And now see if there's two numbers that multiply to 16, but add to negative 8. And what do you know? It's the same thing. It's negative 4. So that tells me that my function h, that tells me that h of x is the same as x minus 1, that first factor I found, times x minus 4 twice times negative 1, which I'll put in the front, actually, or just a negative sign. All right, so that now is the majority of my work done. That is what I want to factor. I said the wrong word. That is what I want to graph. I've already factored it. Uh, but again, if I made a mistake factoring, uh, yeah, my graph's going to be wrong. However, quite often if we make a mistake factoring, we kind of notice it. You know, For example, we don't get a remainder of 0 or something. Uh, not always, but quite often. And so now to sketch this, my end behavior, I can see right away just from looking at my original equation I gave you right here. This is a degree of 3. It's an odd degree function with a negative leading coefficient. So like the last one, there's going to be n behavior here and here. The y-intercepts, or sorry, x-intercepts. You know, I could look at the y-intercept right away. My x-intercepts are at positive 1 and positive 4. And my y-intercept I might as well get to. I've highlighted in green. My y-intercept is 16. So I'll, I'll draw that at some point, but I know my y-intercept is 16. And my multiplicity is 2 around this. And I must go straight through. So I know from looking at my multiplicity, 
the behavior around my x-intercepts so must be like this. Again, I drew a quick line for 1 because the factor of x minus 1 has a multiplicity of 1. The x-intercept at 4 is a multiplicity of 2. And I've already drawn my end behavior. So now let me just make this neater. I can kind of visualize what it looks like now. So this must just come down, go through, turn around, go back up, go back down. And that x intercepts are all done. And the y intercept I can see up there is 16. Right? It was, I can already see it from the original equation I gave you. Awesome. And there we go. Remember again, if you're ever trying to find the vertex coordinates, uh, unless it's a quadratic function, it's beyond the scope of this course. Okay? Uh, unless I give you some sort of other information, like I do in the next question and the last question. Okay, so for these sort of standard questions, all I'm paying attention to are not the vertex, just the general shape, the behavior around the x-intercepts, and the y-intercept, and the end behavior. A uh, lot of little things that give me a very detailed, quick sketch and feeling for the graph. So the last question is this. And for this one, because it's a slightly different kind of question, um, I do give you enough information to figure out where the vertex, or the vertices, of this particular function and where the graph are. That's it. What do I have first? First, I have the graph here of x cubed minus 3x minus 2. And that's what I have right here. Uh, what I want you to do on the same grid is sketch this abomination. All right? Um, and uh, like I mentioned, I actually, because this question's a little bit different, um, I, the setup I've given you, you can make a pretty detailed graph. You should be able to tell where the vertices are for this you know, fairly messy equation here. At this point, I would highly, highly recommend that you stop this video and toil on this for a while. Because what makes this question hard is, well, most likely what makes this question hard is that it seems a bit unfamiliar. And as soon as I start telling you what to do, it's no longer unfamiliar and it's no longer difficult. And we, if we never let ourselves experience uh, unfamiliar questions, then we set ourselves up poorly when I assess you and I will give you the odd seemingly unfamiliar questions. Textbook does that too. Those extend questions tend to be kind of unfamiliar. I highly recommend you pause this, and I'll work through this in just a moment. All right, so the key to visualizing this is to first think, why did I give you this graph of this other equation? And then to realize that the graph I gave you, the equation I gave you, is related to the equation I want you to sketch. And for example, if you look at the equation I gave you, Everywhere there was an x, here I have an x minus 4. But if I look at the numerator, it's the same structure. x minus 4 cubed minus 3 times x minus 4 minus 2. Um, this whole thing is divided by 2 and has 3 added to it. But I can think of those as transformations. And everything I've just said is way more obvious if I rewrite that equation like this. If I rewrite the equation as 1 half times x minus 4 cubed minus 3 times x minus 4 minus 2, and all of that plus 3. What I just wrote down here is exactly equivalent to what I gave you in the first place. Just a bit more colorful. But hopefully now we can see how what I just wrote down relates back to here. I can see compared to the graph I gave you, and I gave you a nicely detailed graph, um, my x, my inputs, are having 4 subtracted from them. So I know that this graph at some point must be translated 4 units to the right. Uh, I can see the whole thing is being multiplied by a half, which means I know at some point this graph must be vertically compressed by a scale factor of a half, and the whole thing is being having 3 added to it, so I know at some point this must be moved, translated 3 units up. And that's the key. The hardest part of this question is now done. And so let me just label those transformations. Recall the order I should apply them. So this is a vertical stretch, or I'll say vertical expansion, by a scale factor of 1 half. Sorry, it's a compression, not an expansion. Um, all my inputs are having 4 subtracted from them, so this is moving 4 to the left and 3 up. Remember, in terms of transformations, I always want to apply my reflections and stretches first, and so I only have one stretch, and so a vertical compression by a scale factor of half means all the x, sorry, x coordinates will remain unchanged, all my y coordinates will be cut in half. And so if I just pick some nice points here, I say nice points, I mean coordinates that I can just visualize quite easily. Uh, any other easy ones? There we go. So I got five points 
uh, on my original function. I want to compress those vertically by a scale factor of a half, so they'll now be like this. Okay, and I'll lightly draw what that would look like. Right, and now I want to move that four to the left and three up. Each of those points, four to the left and three up. So if I start with this point, move it four to the left and three up, it ends up right there. And do the same thing with all of these. And now just connect the dots and remember what the shape looked like. What I'm going to sketch out should be congruent to what I sketched out in red, just translated. So something like. There we go. OK, so notice um, in the end, we have to connect this back to transformations. And that's the least obvious part, perhaps, most likely. Um, and that's what made the question difficult. Once you realize that, it's no longer a difficult question. And again, if I gave you a question just like this now, it's not difficult. I gave you a graph. You see the transformations. So uh, like again, um, when things seem unfamiliar, it either means you haven't learned something, or most likely, there's a connection you have to make that is not clear. We, we don't want to shirk away from those sort of challenges. But hey, look at that. Done videos for chapter three. So uh, 